I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. I think the biggest job of the next generation, like this is what I would do if I was figuring out what to study and, and train in, is predictor. Like we've seen examples of this. We saw the movie Moneyball where they used data about baseball players to predict which baseball teams would do the best. And I used to write algorithms for the stock market to use data to try to predict how stocks would act. And we're going to talk about that more today. And people use data also now to analyze the genome to predict what diseases someone might have and on and on. But the technology has gotten so good, so fast. I'm happy to talk with the two authors of the book, The Age of Prediction, Christopher Mason and Igor Telchinsky. Now, Igor is interesting from the financial perspective. He has a $7 billion hedge fund, which analyzes millions of pieces of data around the world to predict stocks, to predict simply what's going to happen with stocks tomorrow or an hour from now or 10 seconds from now. And Christopher Mason uses data from the human genome to study what diseases we can start curing, what sicknesses someone might have, or what traits someone might grow up with. So I wanted to know, what is the state of this industry? Like, how much can we really predict? How can we get better at it? What are the limitations? And then we just had a fun time while I pitched different ideas. So here's Igor and Chris, authors of The Age of Prediction. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. You know, Chris, I'm amazed at all the things you were able to discover about people by analyzing their genetics. Yeah, it basically, it's a predictive algorithm that's in every cell, right? So you have a uh bits of DNA, RNA, proteins, and you leave these everywhere you go. So I think of the forensics chapter you're probably thinking about maybe, or, or even just the cancer diagnostics we can do with DNA. It's extraordinary. So the book is called The Age of Prediction, Algorithms, AI, and the Shifting Shadows of Risk is the subtitle. If I can try to summarize at a 20,000 foot level, it seems like there's three types of prediction. One is where you use statistics slash AI to model things that could either be very predictable 
or somewhat predictable, like things ranging from, you know, insurance risk to cancer risk using genes to stock market predictions. Then there's the kind of prediction where it's just someone's opinion, like, you know, Rifkin analyzing what the economy is going to be like five years from now. And then there's a the kind of prediction where it's like pretty definite. So the solar system is going to eventually collapse. I can predict that and I know 100% chance I'm correct. Would you say that's roughly three categories of prediction? Yeah, based on facts, uh, based on uh, optimism and based on reality. <laughs> yeah, I like that. What about based on pessimism? It's the same as optimism, right? It should just uh, flip the sign. It just goes negative direction. And, uh, but you can still you know, use pessimism and look at the same facts and, and view it as, you know, it could almost be depressing to you if you think, oh, we're, we're doomed uh, because the, the sun will you know, engulf the earth in a few billion years. But you could think, well, no, we, that means we, uh, we know when we got to get moving by. It could be uh, exciting and get you moving. Exactly. So you point out the exponential growth in data. Maybe you could describe that a little bit like, how much more data we are generating now than even 10 years ago and what that means for prediction. Maybe I'll jump in. Like his first is I think the, in the amount of data is certainly in genomics and just the ability in biomedicine to generate data is what's often been called, at least in genetics, is genomical amounts of data. Most people think of astronomical amounts of data as being really big and involving exabytes or yottabytes of data, but you know, which is trillions of terabytes, but it's actually... Genetic data and genomic data are now eclipsing the amount of data made by telescopes and astronomy. So there's a, a paper that just described this called, is it genomical data or astronomical data? Which one's bigger? And concluded that there's actually more genomic and biomedical imaging data than there is astronomical data. So when you think of really large, you have to think of things of, in trillions of terabytes, uh, in, not quite today, but in the near future. And that really basically means every day that you wake up, there's more data than any other day in human history. Let's do a little thought experiment. So let's say I wake up and now I can sample my DNA in seconds and do some diagnostics like right away. Or some, some AI or some statistics can do some diagnostic right away. What theoretically could I learn about myself this morning from my DNA? And if you grab your DNA, so there's a, a lot of DNA in your body. About half of it is actually microbial DNA that moves and changes and evolves uh, sometimes every 20 minutes, the bacteria are dividing. So you'll learn about any changes in your microbiome, which are the small creatures in and on and around you that have moved. So maybe you could pick some up from, you could pick up obviously like a, a pathogen like flu or COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID. You could, of course, you get sick, but a lot of them are actually things that are the anchor for a full ecosystem that itself is a little pharmacy. So you can see if there's any changes in your gut microbiome. If you have problems with your gut, for example, you can look at your epigenetic changes, or it's not your DNA, but also how it's packaged and regulated. And of course, you can get new mutations. Every day you get mutations. Most of them are harmless, but some of them could be the beginnings of a cancer that you could see if you saw it that very first day. What, what about from the DNA itself? So like you, you, and this is not something you would find in the morning. You would, when you sequence my genome or whatever, you would get all the kind of, hard-coded things about my DNA. What can, what can you see from that? Well, from there, you can tell a lot about you, like your ancestry. So are you, for example, do you have any Jewish ancestry? We had a fun part of the book where we talked about uh, Igor as a, it was Jewish, but then at the end of the chapter, he got even more Jewish because the databases got updated. So we can see, you know, the databases, this is a good lesson of prediction, is that your, your predictions are only as good as your training data and your databases. And, you know, when you change the databases, you'll get slightly, usually improved predictions, but sometimes it can go the other way. But so we, you know, we can look at ancestry, your risk-taking likelihood, how fast you process caffeine or other drugs. So you can really be predictive about how and what way drugs and molecules will be processed in the body of any person. So some of this seems predictive. Some of this, you know, for a fact. So for instance, with the DNA, there are some genes where and I'm going to simplify it with my language, but if they're on, you have like Tay-Sachs disease, for instance, and if they're off, you don't. And so it seems like some things, they had enough data that they were able to figure out which single mutation genes cause which diseases. Mm -hmm. And some data, though, is more predictive, like, oh, is this person more likely to be happy or sad or Jewish or not Jewish? And you do that by matching tens of thousands of humans who have sequenced their genome, you know what they 
this person was Jewish and happy and this person was something else and also not happy maybe. And, and then you can start to build together probabilities based on a new genome. Yeah, in a nutshell, uh, that's in the ballpark, right. And basically you look for differences in the phenotype or what people express as a trait and you compare that to the genome. And it could be everything from height, for example, which is there's no one gene for height. There's not even two. There's probably several hundred genes that really mediate how tall you are, but it is very heritable. If you look at tall parents, they'll have tall kids and short, uh, the inverse. We, so it is a very heritable, but very complex. So it's a what's called polygenic, meaning just more than one gene that influences that trait in a highly heritable way. And so as, you, as we found more of these genes, they get built into the models where we can predict to within about an inch or so how tall you'll be. So if you take a baby at birth, Sequence the DNA, we can get down to probably about an, within an inch of how tall they'll likely be. And how far are we from the technology to manipulate a gene at birth or, or a, a sequence of genes at birth to uh, change someone's height? We're actually doing it, not for height, but we're doing it for diseases and modifying DNA as we speak. So you can actually modify it. Embryos have had disease genes removed, for example, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or a heart uh, disease gene. Or even in, in an adult, there's been treatments to get rid of beta thalassemia by doing gene editing in the person's body as an adult uh, for sickle cell and, and beta thalassemia, these blood disorders. So now, are these singles, uh, single gene diseases? Correct. How, how, so, so with multiple uh, gene diseases, the, this is where the data is like immense. Like the, permuta the possible permutations of which genes could be, like let's say height is caused by 100 different genes out of what, like 32,000 genes or some outrageous number? About 60,000 so total, yeah, yeah, yes. So, so the permutations are in the, I don't know, quintillions, quadrillions. So it's impossible to use statistics or a computer for that. Is this something like AI could start to figure out when there's multiple genes involved? Like with feeding it through neural networks the way they did with ChatGPT? Yeah, you could basically have feed the data from you know basically millions and millions of patients and their and their clinical metadata and their traits and essentially learn what are the new signatures that are driving some of these changes. But but it wouldn't just have to be genetic data. It could also be what was in your diet or what was other factors in the environment. What else mediates that last few percent? You can build into some of these models as well. But how far are we from really the technology to really understand uh, things like height or intelligence or? cancer, you know, all of these factors that involve hundreds, maybe thousands of genes. We're in some cases, we're very close. I'd say a height, for example, is pretty well teased out. Even autism risk, even though autism is complicated, there's several hundred genes. Many of them are now consistently being identified. So we can explain a lot more of autism than we could certainly 10 years ago and almost couldn't barely do it at all 30 years ago. So I think even complex diseases or complex traits, we can now explain pretty well and you can edit them. You can edit, uh, you know, dozens of genes at one time with what's called multiplex editing. In in pigs, for example, they've done up to sixty genes at a time. There's new trials that can give you up to one hundred edits all at the same time, all over the genome. The worry, though, is it's not perfect. So you can, it's like you know, sending someone with a bunch of erasers through your book, and if, if it's correct, you would very precisely do changes in the text of life. But if it's messy, then you'd of course. Be hard, it'd be hard to read the book because you've made too many mutations. So that's what we're working on now. Because the more genes involved, the more you could have side effects in editing them. Like what if some set of the genes for height are also related to genes for, I don't know, uh, some disease or whatever, cancer? Because that is the risk. There are new uh, methods for CRISPR. The one's called prime editing, where instead of breaking both strands of DNA and swapping out a chunk and then having that occur, sometimes off-target effects, meaning not where you want them to be, prime editing breaks only one strand and actually is much more precise. So you... You know, we could use some of those methods or there's actually a quest by many companies right now and a lot of money being invested to try and find newer and more precise methods for editing. But, but the technologies are here today and they're only going to get better. So, so Igor, this strikes me as, so you've been involved in like, for instance, predictive algorithms for stock market predictions. This strikes me as a little different than that because the difference between the genome and its relationship to diseases and traits in the body that's that's probably accurate. Like once they figure it out, they know. Once these once we know these genes affect height, we know forever that those genes affect height. But with the stock market, the the more people know something, the less likely it is to work next year. So for instance, if you're going to predict new additions to next year's Russell 2000, so you start buying the stocks now, well, everybody once everybody starts predicting that, it's it's too late to use this algorithm. <laughs> 
That's right. That's right. In genomics, uh, what you figure out does not affect the subject, but in, uh, in, in finance, the fact that you figured it out is going to change uh, the way the system behaves eventually. I mean, I take some blame on al- that of some algorithms that I used to use stopped working after I wrote about them. So, because I'm, I have the misfortune of, of of loving trading, but also writing, <laughs> and for a while, you know, so I had an algorithm that it might have been, you know, it seems statistically significant to me. But the past eighty times, roughly, the the Qs gapped up between zero point four and zero point six percent. You could short at the open, and they would be flat at some point within the next hour or so. And then I, and it was like an ATM machine for me. Like every time it happened, I I made money until I wrote about it, and then it was actually yeah. random after that. Well, you uh, you made the market more efficient. On the other hand, <laughs> I'm a hero. <laughs> You're a hero. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Main. That's M I Z Z E N and Main. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes. I'm tra- I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts are untucked shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. 
That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. So there's this spectrum between, okay, given data, we can know some facts, like for instance, on the genomic side, or given data, we can predict, but we don't want to tell people our predictions if we're making use of it. So there's like a spectrum there. So like Moneyball, the book by Michael Lewis, predicting baseball outcomes, that's more like a stock market style prediction. Because if you know that everybody, if you could draft people who who are good at walking, then everyone's going to draft it and the arbitrage goes away for teams. That sounds right. That sounds right. What are other categories like that? Maybe even uh, traffic, right? If a Google algorithm was uh, routing everyone in uh, one direction, soon it will not be empty. And uh, where there is no traffic, there will be traffic. And possibly most algorithms that make predictions in systems in which the user is participating will be like that. Mm -hmm. It's only if you're predicting something uh, away from uh, your ability to influence it, that uh, it should not change too much. Did you get ever get nervous in your hedge fund career that you just were going to run out of algorithms that eventually they are all the are because now there's like 30,000 PhDs in every hedge fund trying to find these discrepancies in, in the data or in the, in the outputs. Did you ever worry you would, all the arbitrages would be gone, the market would be smoothed out and, and that's it. In a, in a beginning, I used to worry about it and, and, uh, you know, I would have these interviews and, uh, everybody was worried about it, that, uh, the market would become efficient, but it never has. And, and actually, uh, simply logically thinking, somebody has to make it efficient, right? So, uh, somebody's going to be there making it efficient, no matter what, uh, it may just not be you. That's the problem. But can't my predictions also be mean reverting? So if a prediction worked regularly for a while, because presumably it modeled some mob psychology, and then if it stops working for a while, won't it mean revert and eventually work again? Yeah, and when it does, uh, you know, uh, it'll come back to life. It'll get get turned back on. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, also, obviously, we, you talk in the book a lot about insurance and insurance risk and the entire insurance industry is built on predictive modeling but that's been the case for like let's say hundreds of years what's new in insurance in in predicting human behavior now that has helped the insurance industry it's the immediacy and the real time data you can you can use uh, real time information coming uh, let's say from people's uh, driving to adjust their rates you can use uh, body sensors to uh, change uh, outlook on the health of an individual and so on. I imagine it used to be that you'd fill out a form once a year and that's that's kind of where it stood now. Now there's more and more data coming in. So uh, the insurers are getting a clearer and clearer picture, which theor theor theoretically is good for everyone. Or car insurance, for example, you know, they put a little device that goes in your glove, glove box, basically to say, okay, tracks your speed and your GPS coordinates and looks to see if you're speeding, basically. Uh, but when we got our recent insurance, my wife didn't want it in the car. She's like, I don't want that thing in our car. So we purposely took the higher rate of insurance just because she didn't want that in the car. So, uh, you know, the, the, they're, they're, the insurance companies now are saying, well, you get a discount if we put this device in your car so they can build better models of you. Uh, but you could always just not take it, I guess. But then they make you pay more for it. Yeah. I, have you ever read the book uh, 2041 by Kai-Fu Lee? So Kai-Fu Lee is a big AI technologist from way back, essentially the father of speech recognition. Mm -hmm. And he wrote this book, basically a bunch of scenarios about how predictive AI might work in 2041. He uses, in, in chap, the first story, he uses insurance as an example, where this family um, gives over all of their emails in exchange for a discount, but then the insurance company could model them better. Their insurance rates spiked because I guess one member of the family from her emails, it could be determined that she was in a let's say, not pleasant relationship. And so her risks of accidents, they knew would go up according yeah. to their data. You know, so there was kind of pros and cons to, to the enormous amount of data we can now capture to use for prediction. But my, my question here is, this actually is even is closer to the genomics kind of model where 
just because you know something, it still might not prevent it from happening as opposed to the stock market predictions. Yeah, you mean like, like if you, you're, not, you're not necessarily faded in the sense that you know, it's, most genetic risks are probabilities, but some things are really hard to avoid, like Tay-Sachs disease or cystic fibrosis, where you almost certainly get some, or Huntington's disease. There are some diseases where it's going to be really hard to avoid. But even that, as you write a bit in the book, because of the CRISPR and different genome modification systems, you're no longer subjugated to the shuffle of genetic lottery you got as an embryo. You can, in theory, modify it or tweak it or think about what you hand down to the next generation for the first time really in ever, we have the ability to kind of tweak what is that risk. I feel like it's still like, yes, for this, uh, again, for the single gene uh, mutations that are causing diseases, you can turn an on and off switch and get rid of the disease using technologies like CRISPR. But most things are more complicated. And I'm just wondering, what are the first complicated things that we're going to be able to solve? I think, you know, like heart disease. Yeah, or even like heart disease would be one. And there, you know, there's mutations that can drive this. And there's even known genes for hypercholesteremia that we could target. Uh, some of those have already been targeted, actually, in terms of, again, it's usually one or two genes that have been targeted, and there's more than one. So in those cases, you know, or for example, uh, if you look at certain kinds of cancer, they're driven by, like, a BRCA1 and 2, for example, a lot of breast and ovarian cancers are driven by a handful of genes, probably the top. You know, 30 genes alone would explain 90% of the cases or so, or 90, 95% of the cases even for ovarian cancer. So if we know what those genes are, you could constantly be scanning in the blood for anyone to see, do we see a spike of any mutation and say, aha, I see it. And we're going to kind of like whack-a-mole, take it and get rid of that mutation. And if another comes mutation comes in a different gene, see it and then go after that target. So I think it would end up being, you rarely would need to go after, say, 15 genes at once you'd probably do it over time for more complex diseases that like cancer. But for some things like height, if you really wanted, for example, to be, if you if you think you're going to be, for example, really, you know, let's say four foot two, and you wanted your kid to be taller. So again, this sounds hypothetical, but something like this will probably happen where someone says, okay, I'm going to have a safe way to do, to make sure your kid is tall and, and do it in an IVF clinic. And it doesn't happen yet, but the closest thing is a company called Orchid which is doing this for embryos. They sequence the genome of each embryo and then you pick the one that you want uh, based on that selection. Because you could predict, okay, this this embryo is going to be a female, tall, athletic, high IQ, and this embryo, and, and let's say with, with you know odds on each one, but right. pretty good odds. And this embryo, there's odds that, oh, low IQ, not athletic, Males, and so I'm just going to not. I'm going to abort that embryo and give birth to this one. It, yeah, we're just sort of happening today. Yeah, with Orchid at least. There's one company. There's other ones that are also coming on into the market that are trying to guide IVF, basically. But but it's embryo selection, and that's let's just so, select. So, so I see. So embryo selection before embryo modification. It's yeah. a little easier to do that because modification we don't know yet. We we're just making guesses on the odds, like. We don't know a hundred percent chance this person is going to be six foot three, but oh, it's like a sixty percent chance, which is better than these other embryos. So, yeah. so, so then we don't have to take our risks with modification. Right. What do you think in China they're doing? What they're doing there is a lot more of the somatic methods I've seen, where they're doing things. I mean, in your body as an adult, modifying your cells. They've been looking a bit more at embryos and also actually being much more aggressive with which new modified cell therapies, you basically genetically modify cell cells, reinfuse them into the patient, and then, you know, have a new targeted therapy that happens. But it's targeting something that from our own publications, we wouldn't recommend because it's, uh, if you're targeting what you think is only on a cancer cell, but it turns out it's also on 20% of all the other cells in your body, that'll probably be very painful because you suddenly unleash all these angry immune cells that are attacking what, is, what it thinks is on a cancer, but is also on regular cells. Yeah, like it, it seems like, you know, this could be really powerful for anti-aging if you're, you know, depending on which model of anti-aging you believe, if you attack telomeres and change the genes in them so that they don't shrink over time or you in, are able to inject new ones in and they attach to, I don't know how it all works, that they attach to your cells or whatever. It seems like this could be really great. Like these things called Yamanaka factors that they're researching in, in Asia, I guess, but there's there's overlap with cancer. The, 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 the Apparently, the more you get this kind of treatment, the more likely you are for cancer. So there's all, there's all these risks. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think the 
uh, you know, you have to balance what is going to be the likely benefit from it from any possible side effects or, you know, do no harm is the basis for most medicine. And, and in some cases, we might not know, though. We we'll think we know or we look in a mouse, but we don't know yet in a human. So uh, that's why clinical trials always start small. You start with 10 people, maybe eight people, start small uh, for people that are really need it, and then you slowly expand. What about the kind of stuff that like Palantir does? So given uh, a set of bank transactions and a bank customer, they can make a guess or a prediction as to whether this customer, this bank customer is a terrorist or not, for instance, or is involved in some kind of financial fraud. Like, And again, this is more cl- related to kind of the stock market prediction stuff, because as you know more how they're predicting you, you could modify your behavior. But how close are we to really modeling human behavior like that? That were, I mean, uh, credit card companies do that today. I think like they'll, they'll they'll look at any spending patterns, look at any changes in behavior, try and guess whether well, one just to guess whether it's you. Uh, did someone take your credit card, and did someone else or did someone grab your phone? And then the other thing that they'll do is just look to see, you know, are are you a risk in some other capacity? And so I think, uh, I mean, the other thing it does is, for example, is uh, iTunes or Spotify try and make a playlist based on what you've listened to before, which is great. But then when my daughter got my phone and started listening to all of her songs, it totally screwed up my algorithm. So now it, it's not uh, it's no longer my ideal playlist, I'll just tell you. So given that that kind of prediction, like the Netflix or Amazon style, like since you bought this, you might like this, that's been around for a while. Yes, I'm sure it's improved. But what's really cutting edge with that? Like I, I get it that with genomics, this kind of mapping the, all the permutations of possible data uh, to real diseases and, and human traits, that's important. Obviously, the stock market is is an immense problem that can never be fully solved. What things are 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 blowing you away on the kind of social modeling, you know, given the sheer amount of data we now have as compared to 10 years ago? Uh, so the movies uh, that uh, get recommended to me, I actually like, you know, fair a person of the time. So uh, life's getting easier. Less less thinking to do. Yeah. And and also, I guess, I used to get called all the time by credit card companies saying, oh, this is suspicious behavior, but it was just me being me. Now I don't get as many calls. It seems like they are better at modeling if a credit card is you or not. You might still be a suspicious person just by your weird habits, yes, but at least it knows that now. And it's, yeah. 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 <laughs> but okay, what do you do in situations like March 2020 when the advent of COVID happens? And you talk about this in your in your book. Uh, the market falls. It's 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 the equivalent of what Nassim Taleb would call a black swan event. Like the market falls eight standard deviations more than normal in a short amount of time. Something that should never have happened one in a trillion times, and yet it happened. What do you do when there's really no model? And, and again, the 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 stock market's considered like a fat tailed kind of curve as opposed to a, a bell curve. How do you take into account situations like that where you can suffer significant loss treating it like a bell curve? You kind of divide things into ripples and the waves. So so the waves are things like you described that uh, these are gigantic uh, event, events that are s- specific and the, you, you can see them, identify them. And the ripples are, you know, uh, you know, uh, the stock of, uh, Toothpaste company moves uh, 0.1 percent when uh, something else happens. So we create the ripples, but we stay neutral to the waves. So when an event like uh, 2020 happens, uh, it shakes us somewhat, but we're more or less neutral. So we we stand through it. But uh, where there are waves, there are the ripples too, and uh, the ripples start going uh, in all kinds of different directions. I see that that totally makes sense. So, like for instance, if something big is happening. It's affecting the entire market over a long period of time, whether it's a day or weeks or months. You kind of that's that's not your business. But let's say for twenty seconds, the Canada markets deviate from the U.S. markets by a wider spread than usual. You could say, okay, within the next twenty seconds, they usually snap back, and you could play things like that. Whether regardless of the larger wave that's happening in the markets, yes, it's like that. But it's not only the time; the ripple can have a long duration. But it's just very weak, so that uh, nobody else is really trading it uh, but you.
this is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like The key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply.
I see. So, but that could be so. You know, there's uh, in AI, of course. You know, there's this difference between unsupervised learning and supervised learning. The much like how ChatGPT was built initially, you could use unsupervised learning to find where the AI finds that the context of some patterns of language is related to some movements of stock. We don't know what the connection is, but there seems to be a connection. And then from there, you could just start figuring it out. You just need the statistical relationship. You don't need to understand mm-hmm. why it works. It may not be possible to understand why it works. And by the time you understand why it works, it won't work. So, right. Good. Yeah. I mean, other things you can do with the data, I'm trying to think of other layers of that data. So, for example, where do we see you know, uh, higher rates of different diseases or cancer or infections could be related to what is your, are there toxins nearby? Or do we see, you know, other direct, like a geospatially informed view of healthcare? Could help you stratify risk and even find causes or, you know, essentially why some people might be getting sick. Uh, it's something you can maybe use all the Google imaging data, for example, from Google Earth and look for trends there. Uh, a simple thing is the number of trees or night lights in a neighborhood can influence health in some ways. And so you could use that. I don't know if you could make a lot of money on that, but you could at least stratify risk uh, and help people for better outcomes. I wonder if there are things that we could look at that we're not looking at that could help us decrease let's say a spike in accidents in some geography or you know things that we just haven't even thought of because we don't know the connection we we don't really comprehend why there would be a connection but there is one yeah that's a really good thing about like the, a lot of the tools for uh, stratification all these ai tools uh, will find the patterns and then can build that into a model you can essentially leverage that to make a better prediction we actually do this for example when you sequence a potential pathogen from a sample from a urine sample for example we look at all the facets of the data, not just what species is there, but you know statistics on the fragments of DNA that came out or the pH of the urine or other factors that could better diagnose the UTI. And everything goes into the models. And essentially, we don't even need to know why the model gets better, but if it can predict better uh, what pathogen is present, then, then we can use it. And actually, some of these are under review now by the FDA to really embrace some of the AI algorithms because they work really well and they'll lead you to a better way to do diagnostics and care. What about, what about just like pundit predictions? So somebody goes on CNBC and says, well, I think gold is going to go up because of geopolitical stress, blah, blah, blah. Do you think humans have gotten better given, you know, more understanding of history, more data about recent events, more opportunities to predict and see how those predictions turn out? Do you think humans have gotten better at being essentially pundits? The answer is paradoxically no, because the the more the ability to predict things improves, the more people lean on those predictions, the more they're used, and uh, what uh, what remains is a more and more unpredictable world that gets harder and harder to predict. So by the time, you know, somebody's saying something, uh, about uh, gold on CNBC, everything he knows has already been uh, figured out, and other, you know, more notorious pundits, and uh, the, there's probably nothing left to uh, to pundit about. What well, What about a, a, a macro trader like someone like George Soros, who you know famously predicted the collapse of the the pound in the early '90s? I think it was 1991 uh, or 1992. And you know, was there any? Was it just luck that some macro traders succeeded and others didn't? Or was there something else? Did they have some special insight that that maybe has kind of disappeared from the markets now? I think they had insight and, uh, and, and, and understanding, and there was not too much competition for a high level of uh, insight. But uh, these days there is. Yeah, it seems like that's the most... And like the trading arms of all the banks seem to be very quant-focused because... They do all the high frequency trading and and so on. So 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 again, like where's definitely in medical, there's opportunity. You have a lot of data, so now we can start figuring out which multiple genes, you know, relate to what characteristics and traits. Although there, it seems like a math problem. Like you have to deal with these exponential size math problems that computing can't do. Just is quantum computing a solution for figuring some of these things out? If and when ever. There is quantum computing. I'm not sure there ever will be. I'm not sure I understand it, but is that a, a solution to the exponential problem? 
if it does what it's supposed to do, it could help and give us just that much more compute capacity as on the on the planet. And so that would that would certainly help. But I think a lot of it also be uh, some of the the testing will be done on the ground, you know, or you could do some of it with model systems. But uh, I mean, I, I would be the first one to jump in line if we had r- solid kind of quantum computing up and running. It'd be it'd be great. There are classes of problems of quantum computing can crack, and uh, classes of problems that still remain uh, unattainable. Really, what's the type of problem that a quantum computer can crack? You know, these days they're 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 selling encryption algorithms which are quantum proof. So that's that's one type of alg- algorithm. Which is a good example because uh, classic encryption right now, let's say the way Bitcoin's encrypted, that can be solved by a it cannot be solved factoring a hundred digit prime number it cannot be solved by a thousand supercomputers linked together but a quantum computer can do it in a second so that's a classic example and now you're saying there's algorithms that could make cryptography quantum proof there are there are there's no computer that can solve all problems so because what i what i worry about is are we hitting a point of let's call it peak data where we have the maximum amount of data for certain categories that we can basically handle because the computers are not fast enough. And and they're not fast enough, not because the chips are slow, but because mathematically it's too exponential a problem. Yeah, that can happen. The the data, the rate of the growth in the data may simply exceed the, the computing power's ability to digest the extra data. And I don't, I don't think we're there yet, but it certainly could. Yeah, because it's generating so much data. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be. But peak data indicates that the data will have less utility over there, or that will have peaked past the ability to use the data. So I don't know if I'd call it peak data. It's just uh, un, unwieldy. We, we've reached the past of being able to wield and manipulate data efficiently to only having various degrees of efficiency. Because I think the data, assuming it's clean data, should still get more useful as you get more of it and over time. Right. So you'd have to sort of come up with more categories of that you're studying in the data. But like, again, genomic data seems like it's there. Like for 15 years, we could predict Tay-Sachs and other single gene mutations, like what single genes cause which diseases. But I feel like for something like possibility later in life of stroke or predicting IQ, something like that, which requires hundreds of genes, we're just, we're never really going to be able to, the data is there and it's possible. The algorithms are there, but we just our, our computers are not never going to be fast enough to solve them. Uh, I mean, maybe today, but not. I wouldn't say never because I'd never say never because I think there still could be, you know, in fifty years there could be something that's even beyond quantum, or that's uh, you know, some other variation of a computing, or even just efficiencies of the algorithms could could be improved in ways we can't imagine now. So, so you know, maybe in the short term, yeah, but I think long term, why not? You know, I would say, I mean, if you go back 200 years ago, it would have been inconceivable that people would routinely fly through the air in airplanes. It was, you know, would have, no one would have believed you, right? And and no one believed even the Wright brothers for a while. So I think, uh, you know, a century is a long time with current humanity. Well, it's really interesting you say that about, you know, the algorithms might improve. That's an area I haven't thought. So obviously over the years, over the centuries, statistics has improved. So instead of just trying to like, match something against a normal curve. Now there's all these very sophisticated algorithms for speech recognition, vision recognition, and 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 so on. How much more do you think the math can improve? Because that also seems to be very, we might be at peak math in terms of like how much math is actually useful that's coming out of uh, the academia. Yeah, like math departments. Yeah, there, there's no new, uh, yeah, you know, math, math. I mean, there are some, there's a lot of work on, you know, since you're reconciling quantum mechanics with Newtonian physics, and that 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 is still something that should be solved at some point, or but but there's no uh, you know new kinds of numbers being discovered or entirely new kinds of calculus, right? Most of that's been done since the 16th century, and so I think uh, there there are some. I mean, Newton probably would have argued he was peak math. I don't know, a long time ago with calculus, but uh, but even statistics has with with, with again the rise of the need for pattern recognition, I feel statistics has evolved in the past 30 or 40 years, like these hidden Markov processes and other techniques to really do sophisticated pattern matching. And I just wonder, can that be improved? Uh, Depends 
depends what you call an algorithm, right? Uh, maybe the basic algorithms uh, can't be improved and don't need to be. But if you look at something like uh, Alpha Zero or ChatGPT as an algorithm, then uh, yes, from time to time, a groundbreaking algorithm does appear. Yeah, but I wonder how much of that was okay. More advances in, you know, adverse neural networks versus the speed of computers finally. Look, the speed of computers were there to solve more or less computer vision 20 years ago. But I feel only in the past five, 10 years, it was fast enough to handle large language models like ChatGPT. And that was purely a speed thing. I, how much was related in an algorithm thing? I think there were elements of both. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and also just the amount of data. Like you can build large language models until you had lots of you know data to look at. I mean, so something. All those things together, coming the, the data, the algorithms, the compute, then then you can do it. But you really couldn't do it 15 years ago. Though. Yeah, and actually, to your point, we didn't even have the data. We didn't have all written text up until last year, you know, yep. stored anywhere in one in one easy to use place. So, but even that with the speed, it took a, it took uh, a bunch of supercomputers a year and a half to to crunch the large language model that's now ChatGPT, and then another year and a half of supervised learning. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see how that speeds up. So, Chris, I know you're interested mostly in predicting breakthroughs in medical technology and mm -hmm. Igor in financial and stock market predictions. What other things would you like to predict? I think the methods, uh, you know, you, you can use them anywhere, right? Uh, what we're doing now is we're actually predicting data itself. Data has this property that you mentioned before that uh, when you predict it, the data doesn't change uh, from the fact that you predict it. So we're predicting data, and uh, you can model most things as uh, as data. So you, you, you then you just start going into uh, different uh, industries, and how much can each industry be improved through prediction and through uh, algorithms and through just getting rid of that ninety percent of the work that's uh, kind of mechanical in nature. If you consider that ChatGPT is a mechanical thing in the end. Do you think I can predict what a hit song will be? So let's say I, I take every hit song of the past 20 years and feed it into my statistics slash AI machine. And then I use AI to create a video with a beautiful woman or guy and boom, do I have a hit song? You think that's possible? Good beat, good voice. Uh, I mean, there are, there are some things that are catchiness to it. There's definitely signatures of songs that are poppy, if you will. And so... Uh, and they're popular, so I think you could you could you could build the model, and maybe you could get ninety nine percent true. But I don't know if you could ever say one hundred percent, like any model. You can you may have to model influencers and uh, feed yeah. the song to the right influencers to get it popularized. Yeah, that's a good point. But maybe I can create an influencer <laughs> using modeling. So, uh, okay, here's here's everything I said on Instagram over the past year that got you know a million likes or more and break down those. And then here's what every influencer looked like. So now I'm going to come up with like the average, like super influencer. And then boom, now I'm going to feed that influencer a song and mm -hmm. make a record label and, and use that. True vertical integration. Yeah. <laughs> People wonder if this rise in predictability is going to bring down creativity, but I sort of think it's going to bring up creativity because now it's going to free up your resources in some ways, to come up with even more creative ideas. Well, what do you guys think? It certainly frees you up to ask questions and get very quick answers, which frees up creativity because it saves time. I think, well, I think it's like any new technology. It can be a tool or a weapon, right? In this case, it can be a great tool for creativity. Uh, AI, of course, people are afraid of AI because it could be, in theory, weaponized. But on the creativity side, I think it's going to be a time saver. It's going to be inspiring. You can, you can craft, as you've probably done with the stable diffusion or Dolly, other tools. You can make a land. You can just describe the landscape you're imagining, and it creates it for you. And you can, you know, build from there very quickly. Uh, you know, these amazing portraits. I think I, I think it's phenomenal. It lets you uh, do what I always wish I could do as a kid was like describe something, a scene, an idea of say, you know, a rabbit with twelve different tentacles that was playing, you know, the har harpsichord and also juggling pool cues. Like I could never really draw that, but I can get an AI algorithm to make that in five seconds, right? So it's it's phenomenal. But but maybe there's a problem there where 
you know, one of the reasons why people always say, oh, the book was so much better than the movie is because when you're reading the book, you're kind of constructing the movie in your head instead of it being, you know, and then suddenly you see the movie and it's like, you're so disappointed because it wasn't good as that movie you built in your head. But now we're going to be able to see basically the movies that we build in our head much faster. Yeah, which is, yeah, I think which is still, I mean, it might be, uh, it could be good and bad, but I think mostly good because you could get in the movies out, like you'll see what's present uh, faster, but then also you could have 55 variations of it. You can change the seed kernel for most of the AI art, for example. So you make 50 versions of the thing you were just thinking, and you actually might then imagine things that you weren't quite originally thinking. So you don't just get one imagination, you get 50 of them, uh, or you do some pruning, maybe prune it down to 25 that you like. But I think that's, um, you know, just imagine if you could have 50 brains instead of one, you kind of can have that today, which is pretty amazing. So so what do you think? So that we're in the age of prediction. Obviously, obviously, like I should tell all my kids to be data analysts because that's going to be just this huge profession for the next 20. I'm making that prediction. That's going to be a huge profession for the next 20 or 30 years. 20, 30 years from now, what do you predict we'll be seeing in our predictive abilities and how we use it in society that will just blow our minds? Curing cancer, by the way, won't blow my mind because I expect that. Yeah, that's supposed to happen. Yeah, it's going to be. But it could be, you know, uh, every toilet will be monitoring you. Like every morning you get a little update report on every molecule in your body. You would get uh, information about the environment around you, around your home or your apartment. I think you would, um, I think we'll see prediction coming even from other planets. Like, for example, the, the Perseverance rover landed on Mars it took too long for a signal to go from Mars to Earth, so it had to use image recognition software during a landing to get there. So we'll start to see prediction algorithms and tools even send data back from other planets like Mars. You can get a, you'll be able to get news from the future because it'll be more mostly predicted. On a micro scale, I can say, oh, this person crossing the street moves like someone who's going to rob a car in the next day. So, you know, kind of minority report style predictions, you know, the movie with Tom Cruise. So, so what types of news events do you think will be predictable? Maybe elections. Elections might, I mean, we saw this in Cambridge Analytica. They might be tweaked before they even happen. And so you might know it. You might know the future because you've made the future. In, in, in a yeah. sense, it's possible. I think, well, like, I think if you examine news headlines and, and just examine the news, you, you will find patterns in it already that uh, so much. News follows other kinds of news and uh, it is predictable and so on and so forth. So, but n nobody is really uh, putting that into a news service. That's fascinating. So you, these days. So, so let's disconnect. So, what you're doing there is you're disconnecting news a little bit from reality, which is what newspapers probably do anyway. And you're saying tomorrow's headline is more based on today's headline than in the actual events that happen today. Yes, yes. So you may be able to print tomorrow's newspaper uh, better than uh, than the actual paper that's going to be printed tomorrow, because tomorrow's paper will have some uh, noise in it from uh, new sources, et cetera, et cetera. But your prediction is, is based on mathematics. Well, The Age of Prediction, such a fascinating book. I really do think the job people should be preparing for is data analysts, because that's going to be used in every single industry, more than prompt engineers or AI coders, because AI is going to write its own code, being able to understand what data to look at and why and what, how to make use of it, whether it's the medical industry or sports or stocks or insurance or art, this is going to be such a valuable skill to have. And it's a just beginning field, like the creativity there is, is going to be amazing. But the age of prediction is like a guidebook to what's happened and what's going to be happening and all the ways people use prediction technology and such a great book. How did you guys team up to write it? Like, why did you write it together? How do you know each other? R originally met actually at a lunch at, at Cornell's campus and then uh, just started brainstorming about data and then started walking through the lab, chatting about the use of data for medicine and, and, and overlapping with finance. And it just became uh, exciting to think about more ways to do partnerships, about brainstorming. We have a fellows program that goes between World Quant and Cornell as well, so people can go back and forth. They kind of be this uh, nice exchange of ideas and, and expertise between the institutions. Interesting, you know, Cornell in Manhattan 
Like, again, I'm talking about 25 years ago, used to have a computational finance. Their computational finance department was in Manhattan. I don't think it exists anymore there, but I'm not sure. But anyway, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really, this is like my favorite topic, the age of prediction. Thank you so much. I hope you guys come on again. I really appreciate it. The McNugget Buddies are back. But this time, they got a fresh look as part of the new Kerwin Frost Box at McDonald's. We're talking all new buddies, dressed head to toe in the freshest fits, all designed by the artist Kerwin Frost. So when you order the Kerwin Frost Box with your choice of 10-piece McNuggets or a Big Mac, you'll get one of the flyest McNugget Buddies to go with it. Think you can collect them all? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. I'm loving it. At participating McDonald's for a limited time, while supplies last. When someone accidentally threw away the school play costumes. Oh no. Replacements were shipped with FedEx. And with picture proof of delivery, everyone could focus on the perfect opening night. FedEx, where now meets next. For residential delivery only.